Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar. Um, before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping notes. Um, for the benefit of all participants, attending lines have been muted. Should you have any questions you would like to submit during the event, you, submit, you may submit them through the question and answer space. If we can't address your question during today's webinar, we'll follow up after the program. Please note that today's webinar will be recorded and circulated to all registrants via email after the event. Should you have follow-up questions at that time, please reach out to any of the key contacts listed in the email communication. Please note that Dittons can only issue CLE credit for attendance during the live broadcast of the webinar. Participation on the live webinar must be on a computer or a laptop device. Credit is not available for those joining via mobile device. One other important note, if you have a New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, or Kansas license, please be sure to listen for the code word given during the program. When prompted, you will need to enter that code word into the Q&A section of the screen. If you don't have a license in that, the, these states, you can disregard. With that, let's get started. Hello, I am Caroline Colpoise, a Senior Managing Associate in the U.S. Government Contracts Group, and I have the privilege of moderating our panel today. ESG and Public Procurement, Lessons Learned and Glimpses into the Future. This presentation is the first of our Dittons Academy presentations, a series of continuing legal education uh, presentations on topics in government contracts, which is presented in conjunction with the Dittons Sustainability Month programming today. I would like to take the opportunity before we get started to introduce the speakers you will hear from. First, we will be hearing from our colleagues in the United Kingdom, David McGowan and Jennifer Robinson, both counsel in Dittons Competition Group. They will be speaking on lessons learned from the UK experience regarding social value requirements and the impacts on tenders. Then Gail Monahan, a partner based in Dallas, Texas from the US Government Contracts Group, will tell us about ESG requirements in US government contracts. Wolfram Krohn, co-head of the German Public Procurement Group, will give us an overview um, on the new focus on ESG in the European Union. And Sean Stevenson, counsel based in Toronto, Canada, who focuses on, uh, focuses on international trade, investment, anti-corruption, and government contracts will update us on Canadian ESG trends. Finally, we will hear from Angie Umezawa, counsel from Lima, Peru, who'll tell us about ESG and public procurement in Peru. And with that, I will turn it over to David and Jennifer. Thank you, Caroline. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Robinson, a public procurement lawyer in the UK. If I can have the next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, from the perspective of the UK, public procurement social value isn't anything new. Um, what is new, though, is the priority uh, and emphasis that is being placed on social value now in public tenders in the UK. And this follows what is known as the social value model, which we'll come on to, which encourages social value to be a common thread in public sector projects from inception through to actual delivery. As to how social value is understood in the UK, it is expressed in different ways, but generally is pointing at the same thing. Uh, that's because, of course, social value or ESG uh, is an umbrella term used to capture a number of concepts. Uh, it's sometimes referred to by buyers as sustainability, um, sustainability meaning more than something that's just green or environmental. Uh, but it's generally understood, as stated here in this slide, as referring to how wider social, environmental and economic benefits can be delivered through activities such as contracting or business operations. And it's also important to understand from a bidding perspective that it's a benefit over and above the core deliverables of a contract in question. Next slide, please. So, in terms of a brief history of how we got to where we are today, um, different ways in which you could explain that, but we've only got so much time. Um, 
in terms of social value in the UK, I would say that my focus today will be more on uh, social value from the point of view of England. Um, social value is very a very personal subject. It's generally dealt with at a local or community or a regional level, certainly within the UK. Uh, and so what is appropriate uh, for England may be different to what is appropriate for Wales and so on. And certainly in Scotland, there are very specific requirements uh, and, and have done for a number of years, including the concept of what's called community benefits requirements, which are requirements that must be included within contracts valued at £4 million or more as a contractual requirement on suppliers. Perhaps also because of its personal nature, uh, social value is something, an area where local government here in the UK has led ahead of central government and now central government is playing catch up to a certain extent. Social value, to my mind, has, has its genesis in the UK uh, in the Public Services Social Value Act 2012. Now that's been in place since January 2013, nothing new you might say, but it, it had the effect of starting a conversation on social value. It's an act that applies to all public sector organisations in England and Wales, with some exceptions. It applies, therefore, to central government bodies, to local authorities, so at all levels. Uh, and it requires those bodies to consider how the service they commission and procure can improve the social, economic and environmental well-being of an area. It only applies to services contracts and services contracts with certain goods elements. So its scope is relatively limited. It only applies to a certain geographic scope, as I've said. And in truth, the legal requirement is quite limited. It requires these organizations to consider social value in their procurements and there are no consequences for failure. So it very much was a starting point. Um, another instrument to be aware of when we're talking about social value in the UK is the Equality Act 2010, which is applicable in England and Wales. This is another legal instrument that shifted the focus of procurement being solely one related to cost to also encompassing wider objectives, including those in the Equality Act. The Act introduces what's known as the Public Sector Equality uh, Duty or PSED. And that requires that when a public authority, this applies to all public authorities, to contracts, whatever their values, to consider when exercising their functions, to have regard to the need to eliminate discrimination and advance equality of opportunity between categories of people sharing uh, relevant protected characteristics, such as age or disability, and persons who do not share that protected characteristic. Um, so that was an important instrument in widening the scope of social value in the UK. Jump forward uh, over 10 years uh, and we're now in a situation as of 2020-2021 of talking about the social value model. In the UK, the, the UK government publishes what's called uh, procurement policy notes or PPNs. These are the policy notes that it produces from time to time to set out its priorities in procurement. And they generally will state who they apply to, the types of contracts or scale of contracts they apply to. So the procurement policy note 0620 basically started talking about the application of uh, social value in the procurement of central government contracts. So moving from a local to a central government conversation. Um, that guidance has been around for a little while now, at least a couple of years, and it comprised not just a short guidance note, as they generally do, but quite a pack of information, including a very detailed guide for procurement practitioners, such as, as those of us on the call who are very familiar with the detail of, of public tenders and how social value can be integrated into the procurement process. But effectively, the social value model is there requiring concrete actions on the part of central government bodies. Um, and it also sets out what you can expect as a bidder bidding into a, a UK central government department in terms of social value. Other elements, uh, part of the, the, the story of social value in the UK and other instruments to be aware of if bidding into the UK are um, on this slide. So one of them is the sourcing playbook. This um, is a playbook that was introduced 
uh, across government, uh, developed across government, basically set, providing a tool for public sector purchasers on how to procure public services successfully. There is a main playbook and there's lots of supplementary chapters, including around bid evaluation, which touches on social value. But for today's purpose, I think it suffices to note that social value is highlighted throughout the playbook as a key part of any government tender. And it's also something on which government departments and their executive agencies are encouraged to engage with the market from pre-procurement stage. And that's, for example, to test what the market's capable of delivering on a social value uh, perspective. Moving on to HM Treasury's uh, Green Book. This is basically government's options appraisal guidance for uh, programs and projects. Uh, and as most recently updated, it places great emphasis on social value. Uh, and it also interestingly includes supplementary guidance on how to define, uh, understand and measure social value. And I think uh, a number of us on, on this uh, webinar will understand that, that successful delivery of ESG requires understanding and common measurement of social value. Um, the last uh, thing that I'd like to mention on this slide here is the model services contract. If, if working with UK government, if bidding into the UK, not just central government, these terms are used outside also, these terms are used for high value complex contracts. So it's, it's a standard set of contract terms designed to minimize legal spend in the public sector. So standard terms that government updates from time to time. And they were in their most recent April 2022 update, updated to deal with social value. And amongst other things, it includes social value, a place for social value requirements and also key performance indicators to be measured and reported on throughout the life of the contract, together with um, publication of that information on, on a public database. Looking ahead, so we've talked about history, how we're, how we're here today. Looking ahead, public procurement is being transformed, uh, so they say, uh, within the UK, and we're looking forward to a new Procurement Act coming into effect, hopefully in spring next year. And with that, the social value agenda is going to be promoted in particular through placing a requirement on UK public authorities to have regard and to, to give effect to what's going to be what is called the, the National Procurement Policy Statement. So this is government at a national level saying, these are our national priorities. Social value is important to you and you have your local requirements, but we require you to take into account these national priorities also. And it's putting that in a more formal legal footing. I can have the next slide, please. Turning to the social value model and focusing on it specifically, what is it? I'll say a few words, then I'll hand over to, to David. The social value model has, has garnered a lot of attention because of the headline requirement that it and the focus is tender evaluation, that 10% of the overall evaluation weighting uh, when bidding into a central government must be attributed to social value. So there's no there's no no room for discretion here. It's ten percent, and that's a mandatory minimum. Um, and the the whole purpose is to to encourage and promote social value, not that it it, it is is left as an afterthought. There's also standardised questions and other approaches that are included as part of this guide, uh, which David will touch on. And the idea is. Social value is sometimes quite a tricky area for central government, which because it's, it's covering the whole of the country, uh, contrast the, the local authority that deals with a, a local specific level. And so the idea is to give these questions and to make it easier for purchasers at the central government level to, to take account of and actually implement and go on to deliver social value benefits. So it applies to central government, so Department for Education, Department for Transport in the UK, for example, their executive agencies like the UK Space Agency and lots of other bodies besides. It's already in force, so any major projects or any major infrastructure programmes such as Crossrail starting um, now will factor the social value model in. Um, if I can move on to the next slide, please. So what contracts does it apply to? It applies to all contracts that are subject to the public contracts regulations, which are, are the, the, the overarching UK public procurement regulations. 
um, and it applies where the value of those contracts are above the relevant financial thresholds for those regulations to apply. Uh, uh, and cognizant of the fact that the social value model has to sit alongside our regulations, which have their genesis in EU procurement directives, which our colleagues will talk about, um, the social value model recognises that social value should be taken into account in tender valuation, provided it's related to uh, the subject matter of the contract, and in taking it into account in the tender process, is done in a way that respects obligations of equal treatment, transparency, and proportionality. All that said, uh, and there is the, the carve out that it does not have to be followed where, those, where this, this situation does not arise. I think that the wording and the structure of the social value model is such is that it will be by exception that it is not followed in the UK. Um, in terms of contracts it doesn't apply to, the focus is on public sector procurement. It will not apply or does not have to apply uh, if you're procuring contracts in the utility sector, if you're procuring, we have separate regulations for concessions, uh, and also if you're purchasing uh, good services works in the defence and security context. That said, uh, the guidance very much promotes voluntary compliance with the social value model. David, I'll pass over to you now, please. Hey, thanks, Jennifer. Okay, could I get the next slide, please? So as you'll see there on screen, the social value model has five themes that government departments are supposed to follow and a slightly greater number of policy outcomes. The guidance explains why these policy outcomes are considered a priority. It does so, you know, for example, by reference to the relevant government policies, long-term um, environmental plans going up to 2050 and so on. And it's intended that there's a, there's a golden thread sort of flowing from the high level government policy right through to the actual question and the award criteria being asked. Now, where you're bidding into the UK and trying to win a public sector contract, it's not intended that um, departments apply all these themes um, and all these policy outcomes, although we've, we've, we have seen that, it becomes a mess. Um, departments are supposed to incorporate only those that are relevant and most proportionate to their contract. We think it's generally best practice for a department. We would say to them, look, pick pick one or two that are relevant to your contract. That will, or most relevant to your contract, that will usually be fairly apparent what ones are, are best suited and most appropriate. So as I mentioned, we have seen some instances where departments have tried to include them all or have even included them just as a menu for, depart, uh, for bidders to choose from. Now, that gives rise to a really, really obvious difficulty where you're evaluating tenders, where you ten have tenders who are proposing completely different things. You know, how does a government department judge if bidder A's carbon reduction plan is better than bidder B's training program for long-term unemployed people? It's a classic comparing apples and pears type, type problem, and they're not supposed to do that type of thing. I think it's fair to say that these um, priorities and these themes are not, some of them will stay for the long term, some of them invariably will change with time. Um, for example, COVID can only, COVID recovery can only be there for, for so long, you know, that has a, a finite lifespan. If there were to be a, a change of government, they're going to have a change of policy priorities. And we would expect to see some, some revision, some updating of, of this list, but probably not of the, the overall approach. And that's one area where you know, bidders may be able to do some sort of uh, horizon scanning and inform prediction. If they consider that there might be a change of government, they might be able to look at what that government, incoming governments intend to concentrate on and take an informed view of what the public sector tendering landscape is going to look like two or three years down the line. So in relation to this um, social value model, we have model award criteria, model sub-criteria, 
model evaluation questions. And as Jennifer mentioned, we have model reporting metrics. We have model everything here. It's basically intended to work as a, a menu from which departments pick the most relevant elements. And it's also intended to work as a basically an, an integrated ecosystem for, for government departments to use when they're um, a plug and play ecosystem um, when they're procuring social value. Um, government departments are basically encouraged to use the system you know, as, as it stands, but it recognises that there may be some exceptional contracts out there where they need to adapt the questions, the evaluation criteria, you know, a, a little bit to suit their particular requirements. These criteria are also supposed to be evaluated qualitatively, not quantitatively. So it's the quality of what you're proposing that matters, not, you know, how much of it. And that's done self-consciously with a view to, you know, not excluding small and medium-sized enterprises from, from government contracts. Um, I think it's fair to say that where, where we are now with this social value, it's moved a long way on from some of the previous predecessor legislation that Jennifer's mentioned. Could I get the next slide, please? Okay. So let's have a look at a few aspects of what you know, applying these approaches in practice means. Um, as recently as late 2019, um, I recall the face, the complete horror and the repeated expletives from the commercial director in a major public sector utility where we were dealing with a situation and we advised him that a particular procurement challenge bid protest had merit um, and the results could swing on the basis of a single point on a very badly evaluated social value question. He undoubtedly regarded social value as something alien that was intruding on and, dare I say, just ruining his procurement. Yeah, he didn't want it there and he was upset with it. You know, this is changing. With the mandated minimum 10% weighting, substantial public sector contracts in the UK are being won and lost on the basis of social value, I think on a fairly routine basis. We see some government bodies who are already going beyond the 10% because they want to be seen as trailblazers, taking the lead, good examples. And Jennifer and I have been working on one recently, and it's a, it's a pretty dry technology procurement where the government department has gone to a 15% evaluation weighting on sustainability alone. So that, that reckon, that's just you know, a huge change from what we were seeing five, 10 years ago. If you're bidding in for government contracts in the UK, you really need to be thinking about what your social value offering is. And this is not an area, this is not something where you can just, you know, basically invent something, you know, make something up when you get the tender in. You have to have a properly worked out approach. It needs to be substantive, coherent, well considered, backed up by evidence, and also capable of being tailored to the particular themes and questions being asked. This is also sort of coming in to tender processes at the, the initial qualification stage. It's a do not pass go type issue as well on many contracts. We're seeing um, sort of things, for example, pass fail questions about issues like carbon reduction plans. If you take you don't have one, you fail. They don't look any further at, at your proposal. That's just uh, goes in, in the, the waste paper basket at that point. Uh, possibly a bit of a lawyer's question here. Can any of this lead to public procurement challenges? Well, we have a case from a, a couple of years ago. It's taken by a public interest group called the Good Law Project. And the judgment in that case says, failure to follow published policy, absent good reasons for departing from it, is an established ground for judicial review. So all the stuff that Jennifer and I have been talking about, departments are not free to simply ignore it. If they're not going to apply it, they have to 
properly reasoned uh, proper reasons as to why in that particular case they're not they're they're not going to but generally assume that all of this will apply it's also becoming apparent that some of this can give rise to disputes at the international level. And I, I know that's a, a particular area of interest of my colleague, Sean, who's going to speak later. And the EU challenged the UK at the WTO in relation to some data being requested from potential beneficiaries of a scheme. And the scheme was intended to support low carbon electricity generation. And when you were making your application, applicants were asked about the level of UK content of their project. You know, what percentage of this is UK manufactured content or so long? The EU became concerned about this. And the matter was ultimately resolved when the UK clarified that this data was being asked for information purposes only and did not affect eligibility to participate in the scheme in any way. UK specifically clarified that scheme beneficiaries didn't need to achieve any particular level of UK content. Um, they weren't bound to use UK content. And um, you know, basically that um, beneficiaries would be assessed on the merits of their applications um, without regard to the the amount of UK content in their bid. It was just being asked for, for, for information purposes only. Um, interestingly, additional guidance was then published on all these points, which possibly suggests that the matter may not originally have been terribly clear. So I, fi I find this you know, really interesting that you know, so ESG and public procurement is it's a relatively new thing and it's already giving rise to disputes. And that this is a real, I think, a real area to watch. So with that, I'll hand over to Gail in Dallas. All right, uh, thank you, David. Appreciate it, very interesting uh, background. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm really briefly going to introduce and discuss um, ESG in the context of US government contracts. Um, so when we first started planning for this webinar, I, I thought to myself, geez, you know, ESG has really become a popular term and a, a popular thing in the, I was thinking in the past decade or so, but I hadn't really uh, thought about ESG in the context of U.S. government contracts. And so then I started to really think about it, and I realized that the U.S. government has required contractors to comply with um, a host of ESG requirements, not, not just in the past decade, but for a very long time. And um, as you can see on the slide, um, these ESG requirements touch on a host of different topics. And many of these topics actually have uh, entire chapters devoted to them in the FAR or the Federal Acquisition Regulation, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, US government contracts parlance. And these chapters cover a range of requirements from the, I would call them kind of the old school uh, prevailing wage requirements to the more recent requirements for uh, contractors to maintain anti-human trafficking policies, and the very recent requirement just out, you know, earlier this year for contractors to avoid uh, using forced labor from the Uyghur province in China in their supply chains, right? So um, after I had this epiphany, I did a little bit of digging into the history of, of ESG in the U.S., and, and what I quickly discovered is that um, the term ESG has been used in the U.S. Uh, since around, I think, the 1960s, which I admit was, was much earlier than I would have thought. Um, so then that got me thinking and, and digging a little bit about uh, how long some of the ESG concepts that I would characterize as being enshrined into uh, U.S. public procurement laws and regulations have been around. And what I learned uh, is that the Davis-Bacon Act, for example, which requires the payment of prevailing wages and benefits in connection with uh, public works projects, was actually passed back in 1931. So it was a very early trendsetter on the, the ESG front. Um, but it was really, you know, in, in, in the 1960s, in conjunction with the concept of ESG investing, that ESG and government contracts really started to pick up steam. So in 1965, we've got the passage of the Service Contract Act. And then there's a big one, which is the Executive Order uh, 11246, which actually lays the foundation for 
excuse me, affirmative action programs, EEO reporting, and a host of other uh, labor and employment and socioeconomic type requirements uh, signed by uh, President Johnson. So really from the 1960s on, the uh, ESG requirements just continue to expand to what we have today, where ESG uh, plays a pretty significant role in many of the um, public procurement policies coming out of the current administration. So I thought that was kind of an interesting backdrop, you know, for this discussion as a, you know, just kind of a bread and butter government contract. Or I hadn't really thought about the the overlap with ESG that much, but this 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 webinar actually prompted me to really kind of dig into it and think about it a little bit more. So, anyways, enough on the history lesson. Um, but hopefully, my overarching point sets in, which is this: ESG has been a significant part of U.S. government contracts for a very long time. It's seemingly here to stay, and it's certainly something that the U.S. government contractor community or anybody that's you know bidding on U.S. government contracts needs to pay very close attention to. Um, now, uh, given the breadth of the term ESG and uh, the relative frequency in which new rules and regulations are promulgated in the United States, um, I have no doubt that I could spend you know many hours telling you about all the current you know. Um, ESG requirements that are on the books, but you know, obviously we don't have time to do that today. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about a few that are on the horizon that you you know need to pay attention to and, and be cognizant of. So I'm going to start with with Executive Order uh, 14030, which contemplates amendments to the FAR to minimize climate change impacts. Now, I will say at the outset that um, this proposed you know rule certainly raises some practical questions in my mind. Um, that I, I think the government is still in the process of sorting out. But what it aims to do is to require um, the cost of greenhouse gas emissions to be considered in connection with procurement decisions. And the way that it gets there is by requiring contractors to disclose greenhouse gas emissions and related financial risks and to set goals for reducing them. So an admirable goal, obviously there will be a lot of uh, uh, wrangling and uh, consternation, I would I would imagine, when it comes to quantifying these figures and then using them in connection with, you know, evaluating contractors' proposals and making decisions about the award of contracts. But, you know, it sounds like, you know, in the UK, they're already, you know, kind of uh, working on, on some of these things. So there's a, you know, a, a framework um, to, to copy here in the United States. So uh, next slide, please. Okay. Next up is Executive Order 14057, which also has a, a companion OMB memorandum, if you're interested in it. And this is also a climate-related action, but it's focused more on the sustainability piece, uh, setting goals for the use of zero-emission vehicles and other environmental restrictions, such as uh, using construction materials on, on federal projects with lower embodied emissions, things like that. So both of these executive orders have resulted in new FAR cases, uh, which means that these requirements are working their way through the uh, federal rulemaking process, and they may find their way into uh, your government contracts at some point in the not so distant future. And then the final one I just want to highlight um, today is the 2021 um, bipartisan infrastructure law, also known as the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And it aims to award 10% of funds for um, certain highway and transit projects to businesses owned or controlled by economically or socially disadvantaged individuals. And I'll note that this part of the law was, was actually challenged in court down in Florida, uh, I think last year. And the challenge was actually just recently dismissed uh, about three weeks ago for a lack of standing because the plaintiff in that case couldn't um, actually demonstrate that he was able uh, and ready to bid on um, these types of, of, of contracts. So really just a snapshot, you know, ESG in the U.S. in five minutes, definitely a lot already there, more to come in the future. And with that, I will turn it over to Wolfram. Thanks so much, Gail. And hello, good morning, and good afternoon to everyone from Berlin. Now, sharing the Europe experience, uh, before we start, it may be useful to recall, as most of you will be aware, uh, in Europe, public procurement rules are set on two different or at least two different levels. Um, we have European framework regulations, which set a framework for national procurement laws. 
And we also have national procurement rules, which usually have to be in line with the European framework. So this is why when we look at ESG and procurement, we will take a look at both levels. In Europe, we've seen very much the same experience as in the UK, which used to be part of the EU, where we used to historically have a very strict value for money policy in public procurement, which meant that everything which was not related to strictly economic benefits of a contract was not supposed to be a criterion in procurement. This has really changed for over the last 20 years or so, when it started to become a, a trend issue in procurement to create what we call green procurement or sustainable procurement, which is really the, the early stage of what we now have uh, as an ESG focus. Starting with environmental protection issues in procurement, we later got the issue of social equality, gender equality, fair wages, human rights, um, for example, in the context of fair trade. We have now a huge set of examples throughout the European Union uh, of examples when it comes to greening procurement, making it more sustainable or making it ESG uh, compatible, such as low energy housing, zero emission vehicles, a focus on recycled or recyclable materials, sustainable production methods, and as of late, also human rights issues and environmental issues in supply chains, compliance with ILO, labor standards, minimum wages, and so forth. Could we move to the next slide, please? In the EU procurement directives, which essentially set the framework for European procurement, uh, the use of ESG, environmental and social criteria is generally allowed at all stages of the procurement. The most important category of where this comes into play are of course product specifications. When it comes to choosing and putting out products and services for tender which are environmentally friendly. But it also comes into play at the level of selection of candidates, which may be required to have certain ESG policies in place or environmental, environmental policies. And of course, very importantly, at the contract award criteria level, when it comes to measuring value for money, which is now no longer only measured by strictly economic benefits, but also includes social and environmental aspects as a quality criterion. One thing that's of practical relevance is that on a European level and also national levels, eco labels, which are uh, third party certifications of certain economic, uh, e ecological values uh, can also be used in procurement for setting specifications or for being used as award criteria. It's important to notice though that in all those cases, generally, all those requirements must be strictly connected to the subject matter of the contract. This generally means that, for example, when it comes to minimum wages, you cannot usually require that a company pays minimum wages that go beyond the minimum wages that are generally provided by the law, of course, but to provide higher minimum wages generally, but this must usually be strictly limited to those employees that work on the contract. Remarkably, EU, although it has a very strong policy on sustainable procurement, uh, EU procurement rules permit the application of ESG aspects in procurement, but they don't generally require it with one very small exception when it comes to the procurement of clean vehicles. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, and as noted, um, this is a little bit at odds with the EU Commission policy, which explicitly encourages sustainable procurement at all levels, 
Uh, for the last 20 years or so, the EU Commission has published a large set of policy instruments which call on member states and also provide instruments for introducing ESG and sustainability aspects on all levels of public procurement. However, as I noted, this is not a binding requirement. So all the member states and partly all the individual authorities can set their own policies and agendas. What we'll do just to give you an overview of examples of how this is implemented in national policies, we have selected two states as an example. One is Germany and one is France. And I give you a very brief glimpse of how this is implemented on those different levels. Now in Germany, there is a rule that requires all public authorities in their public procurements to require high energy efficiency levels when it comes to electricity consumption relevant products, i.e. everything that consumes energy, and also to require low emission levels when it comes to street vehicles. Um, those criteria must either be set in the specifications by requiring highest level of protection or used as award criteria, i.e. you need to get sort of an advantage, a competitive advantage if you fulfill those criteria. There is a minimum wage act nationally, which is of course binding on everyone, but there are also higher minimum wage requirements on a regional level, which as I noted, may only however be applied to uh, the performance of the contract and to employees that are used for performing the contract. As of late, Germany has also however now seen a supply chain act, which requires companies on a general level to implement human rights and environmental protection policies, which go down, flow down the whole supply chain through to, to, the, to, to the last level. And this, of course, is really a game changer to some effect, because this is a requirement for general company policies, which goes beyond the performance of individual contracts. Similar in France, um, we have now seen a pretty recent law on climate and resilience, which requires uh, as a future, a mandatory use environmental award criteria in public procurement. This is only to come into force in 2026. Um, it will permit the exclusion of bidders that have failed to comply with their obligation to draw up a human rights vigilance plan which is pretty similar to the requirements under the German Supply Chain Act, um, or requires social and environmental related conditions for contract performance, which means that in future, these French public authorities will, pretty similar to the UK experience that our UK colleagues have presented, be required to ask tenderers for public contracts to comply with these EAG requirements. Now this concludes the perspective on Europe. And with that, I hand over to Caroline. Hello everyone. Um, if you're licensed in Pennsylvania, New York or New Jersey, please write the code word in the chat section of the screen that's listed here. If you do not have a license in any of those states, you don't need to worry about the code word. All right, please make sure to hit the send button so that it registered. And if you miss it the first time, the code word is lessons. Okay, we have one person that's done it so far. I'll give it another minute or so. Please put it in the questions response, actually, because I, I've got a note that the chat is disabled. So please put it into the questions um, and answer. Okay, all right. 
And with that, we'll move on um, to Toronto Council, Sean Stevenson. Thanks, Caroline. And uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to, uh, to you all. Um, in the, the brief time that, uh, that I have uh, here today, I'm gonna to talk about some of the more recent developments we've seen in Canada. Uh, in relation to uh, to ESG and uh, and procurement, um, it does very much build off of uh, what we've seen or heard from um, by my colleagues. Uh, and if I were to put Canada somewhere, uh, I would probably say uh, Canada factors uh, at this point in time somewhere between uh, what the United States is doing and uh, what the UK is doing. Um, so to start off, um, to talk about a little bit of the social developments that we're seeing. In uh, May 2021, uh, Canada adopted the Policy on Social Procurement. Um, the policy is nascent. It's uh, it's nowhere near as developed as what we're seeing in the UK, but I think that is a, probably a good reference point for where this possibly could go. Um, it started off with a two-year pilot project before 2021, uh, and the idea here is to enhance the best value procurement by providing a framework for the inclusion of socioeconomic measures. So as, as we've seen in the UK, uh, those measures are already being taken into account. Uh, in Canada, we are in the process of developing uh, that type of framework. Um, so to date, uh, what this policy has really focused on is um, increasing supplier diversity. Um, this has been done in a couple of different ways. Um, one of which is really creating a baseline. So trying to really uh, get into the data and uh, say, you know, what does uh, supplier diversity look like at the moment? Uh, and how can we further uh, increase supplier diversity? So they've done things um, like uh, include a coaching service for suppliers from diverse backgrounds, uh, really focusing on how we can get uh, how we can get suppliers from diverse backgrounds to succeed more in the the, the public uh, public procurement uh, sphere. Um, generally speaking, the next steps that they've sort of carved out for this uh, is the identification of where best value can be enhanced through social objectives. So really trying to focus on, you know, where we can leverage uh, procurement to, to really ensure that we have a, a robust, diverse uh, set of suppliers uh, that, are, that are benefiting from, uh, from government contracting. Um, now, the, similar to, uh, to what Gail was saying, um, this program uh, on social procurement is far from sort of the first steps. Canada has always had a code of conduct for procurement, and that's touched upon things like wages and benefits, terms of employment, regular working hours, uh, discrimination. And uh, more recently, it's gotten into uh, the, the notions of supply chain. So in 2020, we saw an amendment to the code of procurement that focused on uh, forced labor and human trafficking. Um, obviously, this would be subject to the same penalties of any, uh, any breach of the uh, code of procurement, which can lead to, um, which can lead to uh, uh, essentially uh, penalties for, uh, for bidders or potential, uh, potential contractors. Um, in addition to the social side, I also wanted to, to briefly touch on the uh, some environmental updates. And if we could just move to the next slide, Caroline. Um, we Canada has always had or has had for, for a number of years now a policy on green procurement. Uh, and that is, uh, of course, based on the objective to uh, support and advance environmental protection and sustainable development through, uh, through public procurement. Uh, but more recently, uh, I really want to focus on uh, the standard on disclosure of greenhouse gas emissions and setting reduction targets. Uh, so my colleague Gail had noted that this is uh, something that is currently under consideration in, uh, in the United States. Uh, this is something that came into force uh, in Canada in uh, on April 1 of this year. Um, interestingly enough, we've already seen this in a couple of instances. Um, so specific uh, provisions being included in RFPs um, that are uh, valued at over $25 million, uh, where suppliers have to uh, put forth a credible plan um, to, uh, to reduce emissions based on uh, Canada's uh, commitments in the Paris Agreement. Um, so it, it is something that we're, we're seeing. Um, it, is, it includes, for example, uh, measurements of scope one and scope two emissions. Um, that is, I think, really the first time in Canadian law that we've seen uh, sort of 
scope one and sc scope two emissions be included. So scope one is your own uh, uh, your 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 own environmental um, I, I guess emissions. Uh, scope two is the energy emissions um, through all of the inputs that you're uh, that you're including uh, within the bid. So really a phenomenal uh, and, and new thing. And something that uh, that bidders in Canada are going to have to uh, sort of wrap their heads around as they move forward. Um, so, given the limited amount of time, I'll I'll leave it there. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to to come back on the uh, on the chat. And with that, I'll pass it to my colleague Angie. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Thanks, Chen. Um, in comparison to other jurisdictions, the inclusion of sustainability criteria in public procurement in Peru is quite recent. However, ESG has taken a high level priority in regulatory policy agenda, and the first steps for its development consist in first including a sustainable procurement principle in government contracts regulation for both PPP projects and regular public procurement contracts, and also issuing a sustainable procurement guidelines for all public entities. But how specifically has sustainability been included as a principle in Peruvian procurement laws? First for PPP legislation, especially for concession projects, there is a general stand that all of these projects must ensure economic, social, institutional, and environmental sustainability. In a specific uh, for public procurement law, the inclusion of this principle states that the design and development for public contracting should consider criteria and practices that contributes to environmental protection and social and human development. As such, in Peru, sustainability, sustainable public procurement implies that value for money focus is not limited to generating benefits for a contracting entity in terms of uh, money, but also applies to society and economy as a whole, taking into account ethical, social, and environmental criteria. With the addition of sustainability principle, value for money would imply a due balance between wealth creation and social welfare in terms of environmental protection and social development. Um, Carolyn, Carolyn, please, next slide. So, uh, how has this sustainability principle been translated into specific initiatives? This, uh, the public procurement sustainability has been turned into practice through uh, first, uh, the approval of guidelines for sustainable public procurement, which addresses the actions for government entities when purchasing goods and services in order to reduce their carbon emission and residue output. Uh, there's also an instrument for sustainable public procurement uh, that is a dashboard showing government entities with the largest share of sustainable purchases. Uh, there's also sector specific initiatives um, that are now requiring certifications and authorizations for entry into public meetings. But the most promising initiative already in place to increase sustainability is in the contract award criteria. The tie-breaking tie factors and bonus points in public meetings. This involves granting additional points in public meetings to suppliers that complain that comply with sustainability standards or have obtained certifications, mainly in the environmental and social sustainability areas. This includes international certifications for workplace safety, for environmental management, energy management, anti-bribery social responsibility practices in the workplace also. And, and it also, uh, in addition, includes bonuses for registering before specific initiatives within the Peruvian government, such as the National Water Authority Water Footprint Recognition if, in case of water management, and the Ministry of Women's Safe Workplace Certificate for Preventing Gender Violence and Discrimination in the Workplace. However, all of these initiatives are still being implemented in a small scale in very specific public tenders and not through government-wide efforts. Another obstacle in our jurisdiction 
is the decision to apply some of this initiative, especially the work criteria in public meetings remain subject to the decision of the contracted entity, since it is not, it is not obligatory in all public tenders. Thus, bringing light to the benefit of these practices to companies and to companies entering into public meetings can render in a win-win scenario for all participants. Um, thanks, Caroline. Thank you very much, Angie. Um, well, we just have a few minutes remaining before we close our um, our uh, webinar today. Um, and with that time, I think we might try and answer at least one question. Um, so one question that some of the audience might be wondering um, is how will contractors currently performing government contracts recover the costs of new or unanticipated ESG requirements the government imposes? Um, I think we'll start with perhaps the US perspective, Gail. Yeah, I mean, I would just say um, generally, you know, to the extent these requirements are promulgated through contract clauses, you know, to the extent the government is trying to incorporate those into your contract after award, you should be very conscientious of whether or not there will be additional costs associated with compliance. And if there are, you should, one, not agree bilaterally to accept the new contract clause, um, or if you're going to, to seek some sort of consideration um, in exchange for the accepting. So oftentimes when these things come out on the U.S. side, you know, the direction goes down to the agencies to, to try to modify contracts to the extent possible to add the requirements in. And again, to the extent that there's a significant um, cost associated with that, you should definitely, um, one, maybe not accept it, or two, at least try to negotiate um, some additional compensation to help offset the uh, any additional compliance costs. Great. Thank you, Gail. Um, if none of our other panelists want to take on that question, um, how about we ask something a little bit more specific? Um, as far as in Europe, how can international suppliers prepare for meeting the new European ESG requirements for government contracts? Wilfram? Yes, thanks. I think the question is, uh, the answer is move early. As pointed out, uh, the the problem with the requirements is that there are there's a wide array of requirements and they're all different in the different countries. So what international suppliers should do is that they identify their focus markets and their customers, and then identify the requirements, specific requirements that those countries and customers have. And then they start with implementing the requirements, the policies early, because the new wave of ESG requirements is different from it used, what it used to be. It now it requires a lot of general policy uh, that are implemented on a long, it's sort of a long haul exercise and it's nothing that could be implemented ad hoc. So this is why early moving is important. Great. Well, um, I think that's just about all the time we have for today. Um, thank you again for everyone for participating in today's CLE webinar. In approximately 30 business days, you will receive an email with a link to your CLE certificate. Your webinar login details will be used to process these certificates and no additional steps are required. As a reminder, the code word requirement is only if you are seeking credit in Kansas, New York, New Jersey, or Pennsylvania. Um, with that, I'd like to thank our panelists very much for participating. Um, we really appreciate all their input. Um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.